Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, or, or good morning, depending on uh, where in the world you're joining us from. I'm Jamie Gallagher. I'm a partner in Mason Hayes and Curran's product uh, and life sciences regulatory practice. And it's my pleasure uh, to be able to welcome you to this webinar on the use of uh, AI in healthcare in the EU. So over the next 40 to 50 minutes or so, the plan is to provide you with a, a pretty quick download of some important features of, of where we are right now when it comes to regulating the use of AI in healthcare in the European Union. So firstly, what we want to do is uh, give ourselves a, a bit of a frame of reference by talking about the regulation of, of AI in the EU. Um, and that's something that's by no means limited to the healthcare context. Uh, next, we're going to layer in the, the healthcare dimension. Um, and although the, the focus here is the EU, there will be some comparison uh, with approaches adopted elsewhere in the world. And we're also going to take a look at software and medical devices that utilize AI, uh, which are already regulated under the, well, it was medical, software medical devices are regulated under the, I was going to say new, but sort of newish uh, medical devices regulation. Uh, we'll look at that in some more detail. And then we're going to touch on the use of standards. Uh, before finishing on, I, I suppose, a, a, more of a sort of an aspirational look ahead uh, to try and end up on a, a positive note, I suppose. And, and here to do that with me, I'm really, uh, really excited to be able to introduce our special guest speaker, uh, Cohen Cobart. And Cohen is a manager of quality standards and regulations at Philips. And he spends the majority of his day job uh, guiding and supporting business groups within his organization on how to ensure compliance with uh, the EU medical devices regulation and various other pieces of EU legislation that are applicable to their health products. And then he also then finds time uh, to work with regulators, trade associations and, and various other uh, stakeholders regarding the development of the standards, guidance and position papers that are really uh, shaping how technology can and should be used in healthcare now and in the future. And he's a regular speaker on all things software medical devices, software IVDs, and uh, AI regulation related. And I, I'm actually speaking to you from uh, Brussels at the moment, actually. And I can say, even from meeting with various people working in the, the med tech space over the last few days, Cohen's is a name that comes up regularly as someone who is heavily involved at the, the policy and the working group level, uh, not only on matters related to the regulation of medical device software, but also uh, how AI now features as part of uh, the, the software and the technological infrastructure that's becoming um, a more and more integral and, and prevalent and really sort of ubiquitous part of, of healthcare delivery in the EU. Um, so in terms of a format for the session, before we get into it, just to give you a sense, we wanted to try and avoid the standard sort of style of, of chalk and talk presentation, if you will. And instead, what we're aiming for here is a sort of a discussion where I'm going to spend some time uh, picking Cohen's brains on the, the background to where we are now with the use of AI uh, in healthcare and how that's regulated. And we're going to try and get into some key issues and challenges that need to be worked through now at this stage, um, or, or if not now, at least in the very near future. Um, so, Cohen, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just to get things started, I suppose, um, and for many, anyone that's sort of unfamiliar with your work in this area, could you maybe start by explaining a little bit more about your background and, and I suppose, the perspective you bring to the use of AI in healthcare, and, and maybe even if you can, some sort of um, experiences that have informed your views and your work. Sure, uh, thank you, Jamie. You summarized that well, and, and I'm glad to be able to share some of my uh, insights here. So in terms of who I am, I'm, I'm based in Brussels, um, and I'm a, um, a master of science. I have a master of science in electrical and uh, safety engineering. Um, I indeed do work for Philips, uh, but today I'll be speaking in my own name. Um, my experience is in software as a medical device uh, in various uh, medical domains, going from radiology, nuclear medicine, orthopedics, cardiology, um, industrial pharmacy, and I, I can probably name a few more. 
to to also hardware devices that contain uh, software and AI based uh, systems. Um, in terms of my experience with the law, I, I generally indeed provide regulatory advice to people uh, within different companies, including Philips. Um, and I also represent the industry at the European Commission in the Medical Device Coordinators Group on um, new technologies for a trade association called COSIR. Um, and I also represented the umbrella organization, DITA, at the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, where regulators discuss software aspects, but also AI-based uh, work items are in the pipeline. Um, in terms of what experiences inform my views, I still think today of, of a software incident that happened really early in my career. It was in the late uh, 90s. I was um, an application specialist um, training doctors and engineers to work with DEXA scanners. And, and DEXA scanners is a type of device that is used to diagnose osteoporosis. And osteoporosis is, is of course, it's a silent disease. It's for people, patients that have no symptoms, but where if you have a low bone density, uh, it could indicate a significant increase in the risk of, of you fracturing your bones. And so I was in um, South Africa in a women's health clinic in uh, Pretoria. Uh, I had just installed a, a new scanner replacing the old one and all the tests had passed. And, and as usual, um, the next thing to do is to train the doctor uh, on the use of that machine. And the doctor calls in her patient and um, we walk through the protocols of positioning and acquisition of the scan. We perform the analysis and um, the conclusion is that the patient is, is healthy. So she has a normal bone mass. And so I inform the doctor and the patient of this and they look at me in, in astonishment because the doctor had diagnosed the patient about five years ago as, as being osteoporotic using her old scanner. And so she had encouraged the patient to, to change her lifestyle and, and to take drugs that unfortunately she had to pay out of her own pocket because there's no reimbursement uh, in South Africa for those kinds of drugs. And, and the drugs also have some side effects. So quite, quite a bit of an effort to adhere to the therapy. Um, so what ha happened, wh wh why the discrepancy? Um, did I make a mistake? So that was something I was really worried about. So I spent the whole evening investigating and rerunning tests and, and all appeared normal. Um, and I continued my detective work in the hotel room and, and I found out that actually the old scanner was running a software with a major software defect. And so the next day I was in that waiting room, nervous and with a stomach ache, uh, as I just as I had to tell the patient that she was healthy, uh, but also that the doctor had been misdiagnosing that patient, but potentially also over 700 other, pa other patients over a decade of use of that old scanner. And so I, I get called into the cabinet, see the patient again, tell her uh, she's healthy and, and tell the doctor that the new scanner works fine. And that the mistake was with the older machine. Um, and then the patient appeared to be happy, but the look on the, on the doctor's face was, uh, was telling because it dawned on her that uh, potentially many patients had been wrongly diagnosed uh, with, with a disease that they did not have and for which you don't have any symptoms. You can only rely on, on the output of, of those machines. Um, and since that day, I've been involved in, in other software incidents, some with more severe consequences, but this one definitely shaped my, um, my view on, 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 on things as it happened really early in my career uh, ha and having to tell a doctor and a patient myself uh, of, of the software error made me realize that the, the critical impact that software can have um, and AI in particular on, on in today's world. And so the checks and balances required by medical device law exists obviously for a reason and, and um, that the law imposes stark responsibilities on software developers and the entire distribution chain really became very uh, clear to me that day. Um, so that's something that I've been taking along uh, during my career that, that I for uh, making sure that the products are safe and, and performant. Yeah, okay. And I think that's a, I think that's a really sort of important way to start with such a kind of a vivid example of the real world consequences of ensuring that medical device software AI is deployed in a way that is safe, which is the, the underlying, it, it underpins everything in healthcare. And it should be no different when we bring new technologies to the table. But sometimes you need to 
maybe join the dots with something that can at the first glance seem a little bit abstract, but whereas in actual fact, in the real world, it, it can have hugely damaging consequences if not deployed properly um, and safely. So before we turn in more detail to the healthcare dimension um, specifically, I, I think the best way to kind of get into this is maybe to deal with AI first on its own. Um, and maybe if you could describe for us, Cohen, you know, where we've come from on the path uh, to this proposal that we now have for an AI Act in the EU. And, you know, what has really driven the sort of the demand for a, a, such an ambitious a piece of regulation and legislation like this? Yeah. Well, we've been using software for, for a long time now, huh? but back in 2014, approximately, we started seeing the use of machine learning uh, as software that is able to look at, uh, to learn from data, create models and, and make recommendations and predictions. And so a lot of people saw the benefits of that sort of uh, AI, but there were also many concerns uh, with the general public and, and the users of these systems. And, and those concerns, yeah, they relate to various aspects. On the one hand is the robustness. Some of these systems are rather brittle and unpredictable and unstable. And that's, of course, caused by the opacity of these um, systems. The fact that they work with correlation instead of causality. Some of them are, yeah, especially in the medical field, there's not a lot of data out there and, and some is low quality. Um, so there may be insufficient data also. Uh, some AI systems also have unclear goals and, and lack common sense. Like to give a concrete example, you may have a software that is able to annotate medical image data sets. To, for example, say, okay, this is the uh, iliac crest, this is the mandible, so the lower jaw. But when a patient arrives after a car accident and is positioned on the examination table, a scan gets taken, and then the software is supposed to identify where that lower jaw is, a human could do that. You don't even need to be medically schooled to point where the lower jaw is of that patient. But an AI may not be able to do that because they've never seen those uh, data sets in the training. And so it doesn't have the sort of common sense that we have. So the robustness is often an issue. A second issue is ethical aspects of AI. So some of these systems are rather opaque. If you look at uh, social media, there's the attention economy that they're playing with, there's data privacy and security issues. There's the fact that some technologies uh, have a monoculture, you're stuck with a number of vendors or only one in some cases. The fact that yeah, you may have manipulation of, of the users of these systems without them knowing uh, what is happening. So there's quite a lot of ethical aspects that um, yeah, are, are concerning people. And so in, in reaction to that, we started seeing across the EU, but also beyond the EU, that legislators started to, to put into place uh, codes of conduct, sometimes assessment frameworks for the procurement of certain types of AI. And, and often also, yeah, there was talk of, of maybe regulating um, such AI. And the risk is, of course, that if every, every member state in the EU starts doing that on their own, that you have fragmentation. Then um, we started having visits also in 2020 from some of the big tech uh, companies. Uh, Sundar Pichai from Alphabet, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, they came to Brussels. Also Elon Musk of Tesla. Um, they all spoke up in favor of AI legislation, uh, potentially as an answer to deal with privacy and antitrust uh, issues or, or the fact that they're being accused for, uh, uh, that some of these systems are accused for influencing elections. So they saw also a benefit in, in maybe regulating these systems. Um, so that was what is in the background. Um, and then the commission made a survey to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? Is it through standards? Is it codes of conduct or maybe hard law? And um, yeah, the majority of the respondents to the survey uh, suggested uh, re legislation. Uh, and this kind of played also into the view of, okay, maybe we can actually use legislation to advance the competitive position of European companies. Because if you, if you look at how we score compared to other continents, uh, China or the US, other countries, yeah, we're not doing that well in terms of uh, the high uh, performance computing systems we have, the amount of researchers that we have, 
the data that we have accessible. So if you score all of this, rarely number uh, two or three, we're uh, usually number two or three, not number one. It's that number one position is typically taken by other countries. And so there's this concept of using legislation to advance the regulatory position. It's, it's described in a book by Anna Bradford, The Brussels Effect, that uh, yeah, I could explain. Um, for example, imagine that in the EU, we put into place uh, an AI act. And um, if you want to be active in the EU as a company, you of course would need to comply with that legislation. Um, however, some companies will not just be active in the EU. They may also be active in another country, like for example, Brazil. And Brazil, there may not be such a law in place. And then, of course, you're competing against companies that don't have the same costs because they're not subject to the same regulatory burden. Um, what then happens is that that company that is interna internationally active may start to lobby uh, the Brazilian uh, policymakers to say, maybe it's a good idea that you put in place um, uh, an AI legislation as well to, to, of course, make sure that the users of those systems are protected. Uh, and have safe systems. And then, of course, um, the influencing is going in a direction of, of not reinventing the, the, the wheel, but taking what already exists potentially in other jurisdictions. And so uh, there's a fair chance that uh, Brazil, if they come second, would be a rule taker rather than a rule setter. And then the competitive edge comes here. That company that already complies with EU law um, has an edge compared to the, the local companies who still have to integrate these costs. And this could uh, translate itself into a, a competitive advantage. The disadvantage of that, however, is that it's usually the big international players that um, benefit from this. The, the smaller companies tend to suffer more because they may not have the regulatory expertise to navigate that uh, legislative landscape. And so the commissioners there are, and the policymakers they are aware of this and they're trying to alleviate that by for example, thinking about creating dedicated help desks for uh, small and medium enterprises, maybe giving them priority access to test sandboxes, maybe even reduce notified body fees. And so in 2017, um, you start to see that the commission and policymakers, the parliament had hearings. The commission was also organizing workshops um, to figure out, okay, what are we gonna put into that legislation? And then now five years later, uh, the commission has issued its draft artificial intelligence act so that was in april 2021 um, and now one and a half years after the draft was published the act has been yeah, read and amended in parliament and council and so that's where we are now parliament and council are discussing what should go into this into this act um, and they've yeah, reached or they're almost uh, reaching their compromise positions the goal is now or the Expectation is that they will vote on this text uh, in Parliament and in Council this month. Parliament may be delayed to Q1 next year, we'll have to see there. But if the vote turns out positive, the trilogue between, on the one hand, the Council, on the other hand, the Parliament and the Commission can start. And so if we follow the, the, the timelines of the Commission proposal, we as uh, AI system manufacturers, uh, if we're in scope of the law, we would need to comply as of uh, Q2 2023, because two years transition is foreseen in the proposal. The council says maybe we need to add an extra year, so that would be Q2 2025. Uh, in the parliament, I hear uh, divergent voices. I hear people say two years, but I also hear people say half a year. So half a year would mean that it could be as early as end 2023. Uh, of course, with the MDR and the IVDR um, slipping implementation timelines, for example, on Udemet, um, and then the AI Act implementation following on its heels, it will be a phenomenal challenge for, for companies that are subject to both legislations to stay uh, centered during these uh, turbulent times. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, is it... There's a few points there. I, mean, I, I want to keep us moving as well. But when you say common sense and AI, I'm, I, I'm reminded of the example of the, you know, the model that can on a, a radiologist on a scan can can outperform radiologists on spotting maybe one type of lesion. But of course, the radiologist is spot is almost subconsciously 
scanning for anything and everything else on the scan as well. So this is, I think there's a that speaks to me getting ahead because we're going to talk about healthcare now and AI in a minute, but speaking to maybe the the combination of you know technology and uh you know the human element can sort of balance out that brittleness or lack of robustness sometimes and add its own advantages. And yeah, I mean on time timelines, I mean I think no matter what uh, this is happening very soon. I mean, even even two to three years would be a very short implementation period for a lot of stakeholders, I think. And and the lack of certainty as to, you know, we're all just waiting with bated breath to see what the number is going to be is, is sort of hampering effective planning and, and strategizing. Um, but I mean, that that's the, the AI side. And so maybe if we do now actually turn to, to look at AI and healthcare specifically. So Cone, where do you maybe see the biggest opportunities for for ai to add value in the healthcare context and you know maybe just to bring that to life you know do you have any sort of examples of you know success stories or sort of real world case studies where that that type of thing is already visible yeah yeah i mean i work with different types of ai uh, support vector bayesian techniques machine learning more recently and and it's already proven itself, especially in pattern recognition. Um, for example, to screen mammograms for cancers or to contour tumors for radiotherapy uh, or cancer treatment follow-up. Uh, but that's usually a rather painstaking uh, task, um, which an AI can do much more precisely than, than humans can and, and more consistently. And so that, that there it really frees up time for more meaningful tasks like engaging with the patient. It's also helpful, of course, to, to provide insight into vast amounts of data that clinicians are faced with nowadays. And that's not always for medical device purposes. Sometimes it's also just to optimize um, the way people spend their time, the way the healthcare um, machine is uh, working. So to optimize productivity, for example, to predict when a patient is gonna not show up or when it's time to service certain um, devices. It also uh, yeah, provides a lot of potential in terms of augmenting the clinical decision making. Like if you look at oncology nowadays, uh, about 10,000 studies are published every year. So an oncologist simply doesn't have the time to read all of these studies. Uh, but you have semantic engines out there that are able to read these studies and to make sense of them using top, uh, ontology, so looking at the meaning of certain terms, and make sure that uh, the clinicians have at their fingertips the latest information to make, for example, a differential diagnosis uh, using the latest um, yeah, standard of care, um, like using the AI as a sort of virtual assistant then. And then there's also the more, um, yeah, more recent applications where AI is combined with high throughput computing. Uh, to do certain medical acts that humans may not be capable of. Um, and there's been speculation in, um, yeah, in, in scientific reports that we could, for example, use uh, a robotic, uh, an AI-enabled robot, surgical robot, to perform types of eye surgery uh, for certain eye diseases where today we don't have a treatment because... Um, a human cannot make the surgery with sufficient precision or speed uh, to do things on the eye to, to, to accommodate for that disease. And so high throughput computing combined with AI could be able to yeah, allow us to treat novel disease, diseases that until today there's no solution for, or at least provide better solutions. And then my biggest um, yeah, um, aspiration really is that it's uh, it's gonna play a major role in in uh, getting closer towards providing personalized and precision medicine. So that's healthcare that's person centered, integrated, and co managed, where we are optimizing the healthcare provision and and we provide uh, personalized care services by making these care services more responsible and more responsive uh, to care needs and aspirations, making sure that they're preventive rather than reactive. Um, to ultimately yeah, create a, a more flexible and sustainable set of integrated health and, and social care services. So such um, precision medicine supports meaningful engagement and, and interactions between the patient and the care provider. And they, they often comprise learning systems um, 
with largely automated feedback loops throughout the value chain so that the service can be adapted and enhanced on an ongoing uh, basis. And in that world, machine learning enabled medical devices may play a, a major role. Um, for example, um, we may, and it already exists today, uh, cleared under the medical device regulation, AI, that has been trained up to a certain level when it leaves the factory, but that needs to be trained further on uh, the data streams on a particular hospital to, to reach a level of performance that you can today not reach with any rules engine or other traditional software technique for the prediction of, for example, sepsis and delirium. So where you're looking at data streams um, that may differ from hospital to hospital, but also the practices in these hospitals may differ. In one hospital, the nurses may wash their hands a bit more than in another, and that could have an impact on, on the onset of sepsis or delirium. And so training these systems on, on specific settings may allow us to bring the performance much better than if it's trained uh, as if everybody, if every hospital is the same. Another possibility could be that if you use AI-based systems to calibrate the um, product or the device to a specific patient. Today, if you, if you see people with a prosthetic arm, this is often a very rudimentary arm uh, with, a, with a sort of hook at the end. Maybe they'll move, be able to move it a bit, but it's usually only sufficient to open a door with it. Uh, but you cannot take a cup of coffee and then drink with your prosthetic arm that coffee without spilling. It's, it's simply today not able to to yeah, execute the fine motor movements that you, you, you would like it to perform. But we could get there if we use uh, brain computer interfaces uh, and train that system on those computer brain interfaces to perform certain protocols, a bit like you were to go to a physiotherapist with a new prosthetic and then walk on the stairs or, or uh, do certain manipulations, learning to, to let the patient adapt to the prosthetic, we could turn it around, let us, uh, perform such protocols and let the prosthetic adapt to the patient instead. And that, of course, would, would require that sort of systems that continue to learn uh, as they're being used. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it re there are so many outlets. It really does seem like there are so many ways that, you know, these technologies can play a role in, in really enhancing outcomes and, and quality of life for patients. I mean, when you mentioned precision medicine, I was I attended an event recently that was all about precision oncology and how AI models are being used to affect, to revisit or to, to look in, in closer detail at all the data that clinicians have available to them to match the right treatment to the right patient and investigating different types of biomarkers. And you have clinicians sitting alongside uh, computer scientists and data scientists from large uh, tech organizations you know, engaged in this dialogue about how to deliver healthcare, which is really exciting. It's it's can become highly technical. Um, but I suppose like in so many areas, healthcare is no different. You get this sense that that AI and these technologies are becoming this, this ubiquitous presence in our lives, uh, including healthcare. And I suppose that's all the more reason that they're developed and deployed in a in a way that you can prove is is safe. But I mean maybe to to kind of cast our perspective a bit broader now in a way, you know, maybe sort of comparatively speaking, um, how does the EU proposal compare? Well, you've, you've touched on this a little bit already, but how does it compare to frameworks regulating AI and healthcare elsewhere in the world? Um, well, in, in most parts of the world, um, legislators are updating their sectorial legislation. So they're updating their medical device legislation. That's the case in China. That's the case in the UK. That's the case in, in the US. Um, but I start to see, yeah, since, since the EU published the AI Act, that other legislators seem to be taking horizontal approaches as well, meaning it's an AI legislation that applies across the different sectors. So to toys, to elevators, to cars, to, to medical devices. And Europe was first with that, but now the US uh, White House Office for Science and Technology Policy, they also released a, a draft blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Um, it's not a law, uh, really, uh, and it doesn't contain any non-binding um, 
requirements. It's, it's voluntary, but it contains principles that should then be applied across the different sectors. So you could call that a soft law. In, in Canada, on the other hand, um, the legislators proposed Bill C-27, and, and it contains three parts. One is the Consumer Privacy Protection Act, one is the Personal Information and Data Protection Tribunal Act, and the third one is on artificial intelligence and, and data. It's a law, so just like in the EU, but it's far less prescriptive than the EU's proposed Artificial Intelligence Act. So you, you may wonder, of course, uh, does that make sense to have a horizontal approach? Um, and, and I'd like to quote uh, Mark Andreessen. He's the former co-founder of, of Netscape and, and now a, a venture capitalist. He once said, I think it's almost 20 years ago, um, that software is eating the world, um, dissolving all sorts of conceptual boundaries that once underpinned our, our regulatory systems. And so, Software, in other words, it blurs the boundaries between, on the one hand, products and services, between physical and intangible products, and in our world, between medical devices and the pharma sector. Um, and so consequently, all sorts of industry sectors are merging and mutating with, with software often as, as the glue or the driving force uh, for that transformation. And seen from that perspective, of course, the horizontal approach is, is, is the more prescient. Um, some say it's it's the regulatory version of, of ripping the band-aid off um, because in the long term people may agree that it's the better approach but in the short term there is still a lot of uncertainty and, and things could get a lot a bit or a lot worse depending on the perspective before they get they get better and while that vision is right if i really look at what the commission put on paper and and what the parliament and the council are doing there's still a lot of flaws in, in uh, the legislative proposal. Um, first of all, while the proposed act is, is said to be horizontal, it's not really horizontal um, because the pharma sector is, is, for example, out of scope, even though software is increasingly used in that sector. And as we enter the age of, of personalized medicine, we see the onset of, of bedside manufacturing. Uh, so that's making custom-made drugs that are created specifically for, for one specific patient, not at the factory, but at the hospital, based on data generated by clinical and, and manufacturing decision support systems. And such software, if you look at what, what legislation applies to it, well, it falls in the space of often the medical device regulation, but also the pharma legislation. And so it would make sense to look at creating a legislation that applies to software, where we would take out whatever is specific in pharma and, and medical device legislation and put that into that horizontal baseline. And then if necessary, the sectors can build their sector specific pillars on top of that. So that, that would be the ideal situation, but pharma is out of scope. Um, so it's a bit of a, a missed opportunity in my view in that sense. Also, um, uh, a horizontal legislation should provide minimum foundations. And, and make sure that the terminology it uses is aligned with what you see being used in, in, the, in the sectors. Uh, so that the sectors then can build on top of that and add sector or technology specifics. Um, but looking at the proposals, we're far removed from the LDU as, as there's many overlaps, there's many alignment issues still, and, and worse, there's even conflicts between what the AI Act uh, prescribes versus what is in, for example, the medical device legislation. So rather than being the horizontal version of, of ripping the band-aid off, it may, not, it may turn out to be more, more painful for our sector because it will add complexity, costs, and, and legal uncertainty, and consequently also uncertainty with the investors, uh, with, yeah, some may argue, little or no added value for the patients. On the contrary, um, some innovative AI-based medical devices may not even reach the EU anymore because there are requirements in the Act that go counter to, to those in the MDR. Um, and that would deprive patients from, yeah, in some cases, for certain devices from the most advanced treatments and, and make it harder also for EU scientists and doctors to participate in, in cutting edge uh, research. Yeah, I mean, we've, you've mentioned the, the timelines as well, the kind of the overlapping timelines. And I think, you know, software medical devices, IVDs, that, that's a, a really, you know, pertinent example of, 
of how these challenges are are going to manifest. I mean, can you can you explain a little bit more about where that overlap occurs between yeah. the MDR and and all the the devices and products regulated under that framework, and then we have the AI Act coming in, sort of above or on top of that, or related to that in a way. Yeah, maybe I have to start by explaining what's in scope of the act. Um, so- most digital medical devices are in scope, and, and here's why. Um, the Act addresses AI systems that are high risk, so two, com- two conditions. It has to be an AI system, and it has to be high risk. AI system, it comes with definitions, and if I look at all the amendments in, in the, caused by the Parliament and the Council, I mean, this is by far the topic that most people talk about. It's the definitions that are circulating are yeah, very elusive, very broad also, and, and I read many of them as, as yeah, in essence, they're talking about all software. Um, so it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, in my view, to use that term AI if, if, if it addresses all software. You could call it just a software legislation, but that's obviously not, at least not the impression that I have what legislators want to do. They want to carve out certain types of software which they call AI. Um, but yeah, it, the boundaries of what that then is, is unclear. Um, from my perspective, um, rules engines are part of most um, definitions. Um, even uh, regression systems um, would be part of such systems. So it's very broad. Now, it's not because you have a software system that is AI, that it's also regulated. It's only when it's high risk that it's regulated. And so which systems are high risk? Well, that's those systems that are either regulated products under sectorial legislation, where the sectorial legislation requires a third party assessment. So in our world, a notified body needs to assess uh, medical devices that are class 2A or higher, or IVD products that are class 2B or higher. Now, if these products have or are an AI system, then they're considered high risk according to the AI Act. Um, so that would mean that because yeah, since the new legislations, the MDR and IVD are in place, and since these new classification rules are in place, almost all products are class 2A or 2B, yeah, almost all digital products. And so potentially the scope is, is very, very big. Um, Aside from those high risk AI systems, the act also applies to AI systems that are not necessarily covered by sectorial legislation, but that cover or that pose certain transparency risks. Um, It, for example, addresses software that is used to decide whether your son or daughter is allowed to go to university, for example, or to to correct uh, exam scores. It, for example, also addresses systems that are used by the, the parcel delivery systems or, or the, the deliveries of this world. Um, software that decides who gets a job, who doesn't get a job uh, in, in the microeconomy. The way it's worded um, in the commission proposal, it makes me think that this could also have an impact in our sector on products that are not necessarily medical devices, but that are workflow or task generators in, in hospitals or health institutions. If I read the definition of the commission, this is being amended by the council and it, it may fall out of scope, these hospital information, laboratory information or radiology information systems, but we'll have to see where this lands in the trilogues. And then there's a lot of amendments in the parliament that, that further expand what are considered AI systems with transparency risk. And, yeah, one of these amendments, for example, says, look, anything used in healthcare or, or health, it doesn't even have to be in, in, in healthcare institutions. It can also be general health and wellness systems where you're using sensitive health data, um, where that product can have a direct or an indirect effect on the health. Well, we consider these to be systems with a transparency risk. And so that would bring also potentially such uh, general health and wellness products um, under the scope of the AI Act. And so that's that's kind of an overview of what's in scope. If you then look at um, yeah, what the AI Act really requires, it's um, in essence, they took the MDR as inspiration, but they uh, simplified it. Um, and in the simplification, there were unfortunately quite a lot of misalignments and conflicts that appeared. 
But in essence, it requires that you have a, a risk management system, a quality management system, that you see, you mark your product, perform a conformity assessment, perform vigilance reporting, have technical documentation in place, uh, use uh, high quality training, validation and training data sets, uh, provide logging capabilities to your products so that if something happens that you can figure out whether the AI was at fault or whether the human was at fault. And then there's quite a few aspects related to transparency instructions for use, but you need to provide in that, how you describe limitations uh, and the capabilities of these systems. So on the surface, it looks, yeah, like things a lot of medical device manufacturers already do. If you dig into the detail, you start to see yeah, the complexity that this creates and, and the misalignments and the conflicts that it creates. And so it will also create uh, what I call a, a legislative lasagna because we already have the medical device regulation that applies to our medical devices. And for some of these medical devices, because they have a moving component, the machinery directive also applies. Some of these, they have, for example, a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth component, the radio equipment directive applies. And now we have the AI Act coming on top of that. And soon, uh, potentially also the European Health Data Space and the Data Act may apply. So six different legislations uh, that all talk about conformity assessments. Um, so this may become relatively complex uh, to navigate as a space. Um, and then yeah, an issue that then often arises, okay, what if you have a requirement in the um, in the medical device regulation and a requirement in the AI Act, and they both talk to the same thing, but there's subtle differences? Okay, which which legislation should I now follow, or should I follow both? And then generally, the lex specialis principle is is, is used. It's a legal principle that you, Jamie, can maybe talk more to than I can, but in practice, it leaves uh, a lot of uncertainty because it's not clear. Uh, from experience that we have between the medical device regulation and, and the machinery directive, it's, it's not clear which legislation should take precedence over another. Is it the machinery directive because that talks to moving components or is it the medical device regulation because it talks to medical devices? Similarly, should we use the medical device regulation because it's about medical device or the AI Act because it's an AI based medical device system? So that's not clear. Also, there may be requirements that are more prescriptive in one than another, but it's not always clear because sometimes they're both very prescriptive with subtle differences. Okay, what if they conflict? Which one do we then need to, to apply? In the financial sector, they even say that, and I think the same goes for our sector, the bar is put higher in the financial legislation. And I would say also in the medical device legislation when it comes to, for example, post-market surveillance, uh, because we need to do post-market clinical follow-up, or when, it talks, when, when we consider clinical evaluations, performance testing. So the bar is put higher for performance of these systems than what is required in the Act. Should we then ignore what is there in our legislation for sake of, of what is written in the AI, because it has AI? And that, that's not clear. And I think this is something that has to be clarified up front, because if we look at what happened under the MDR and machinery directive, these conflicts were not addressed in the law. The medical device coordinators group or the people responsible for, for implementing the machinery directive, they're not willing to put on paper which legislation proceeds over another or how to act in, in, in the, um, in, when conflicts arise because they don't feel they have the mandate to do that. It's only the European court that can do that. And so you end up in this limbo as manufacturers of, of not knowing what to do and not having any really tangible things to tell to your, your venture capitalist or your investors uh, on, on where, what the legal status is of, of your product. And, and that creates legal uncertainty on top of the existing legal uncertainty that we, are, that we will have with that vague AI system definition. And the fact that that definition refers to techniques that may be changing over time. It's possible that we today use, for example, um, Random forest, it's a technique not mentioned in, in, in one of the annexes of, in annex one of the uh, AI Act. And you could say, okay, I'm not in scope of the act because I'm gonna use random forest as a technique. And then one year later, the commission may actually update the annex and then you realize, oh darn, uh, the act applies to us because they've added random forest uh, as a technique. So 
This creates legal uncertainty, and in my view, that should be addressed before the act is, is established. Yeah, and I mean, I should say, I mean, that that paints somewhat of the legislative lasagna is, I think, a really good, memorable way of sort of encapsulating a, a lot of the, the, the issue here. Um, and I mean, it does paint a pretty, a pretty daunting picture for the moment, um, recognizing, of course, that we haven't landed with the finalized text just yet. But um, I think, you know, the industry regulators and notified bodies included are sort of waiting um, and wondering still um, with a lot of questions. And speaking of questions, um, it's been in, put in the chat box there for everyone. And I admitted to mention at the outset, if people have questions, there's a Q&A function. And so, so please do feel free to add in any questions and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the session. I mean, one of the big questions, I suppose, Colin, that might be on, on everyone's lips after th that uh, comprehensive overview is what to do, what can we actually do at the moment? What can we do to ensure compliance, if anything? And I know, you know, standards do have a role to play potentially. Um, in many sectors, as well as healthcare. So could you tell us a bit more maybe about the role of standards and, and the role they might play um, in how industry can actually start to go about achieving compliance with all of this legislation? Yeah, well, standards, both manufacturers and the commission, they need standards um, because they, while the legislation says what we need to do, the standards say how we need to do them or they give us one option to implement them. For example, the AI Act or some amendments talk about us manufacturers having to perform an ethical technology impact assessment, or maybe to assign a green AI label and to, to assess the environmental impact of our, our AI systems. How do you do that? That's not what, what you will read in the legislation. Uh, and then you, as a company can decide, well, I'll figure out my own way to deal with this. But this, of course, gives you legal uncertainty because a notified body will need to assess that. And it's helpful if you have some certainty up front before you do the submission on what a notified body expects and what, what um, um, regulators expect. And so this is where standards play a major role because standards give manufacturers a practical way to implement the legislation. And um, they also give an assurance that in the end, their work will be accepted by, by these notified bodies. That's because the commission can publish standards that it deems suitable to support the Artificial Intelligence Act. They can publish these standards in the official journal of the European Union. And those standards, they're called harmonized standards. And they, they have a special status because they provide manufacturers legal certainty uh, as they give them the so-called presumption of conformity. If you comply with that standard, you are your product and, and you as a manufacturer comply with this and this requirement of the AI Act. So that makes it more predictable uh, to survive a, a notified body uh, scrutiny. Um, however, yeah, rather than providing solutions, what I see at the standardization horizon is rather concerning for me because I see an overwhelming growth in AI standardization. Uh, and this risks landing us in, in a standardization jungle similar to what we face today in, with cybersecurity, where it's really very hard to navigate all these standards that have been uh, uh, made available. Uh, and this, of course, brings increases the costs of us uh, companies if we have to comply with all these standards. And hopefully, of course, at some point in time, these standards will, will converge and, and we will only need to apply some of them. But again, in the beginning, it, it may be rather uh, complex to navigate until we have a harmonized standard uh, issued by the commission that says, OK, that's the one really that we uh, would support from our point of view. Another thing that I see happening in the standardization world is that many of the AI standards are, they're of low quality. Uh, and that's mostly because we lack experts, not just people with hands-on experience in, on programming, but also business application people that know how AI systems are being used. So if, if I look at a lot of these standards, they're also often empty shells. They, they contain a lot of should requirements and only a handful of must requirements. So they're very liberal in, in what they allow you to do. And of course, if some of these uh, low quality standards become quasi mandatory because they become harmonized, then yeah, you could wonder to what extent does this really add value or will we be forced to adopt something and then do these more or less elaborate moves like in capoeira dancing with our notified body without touching any substance. I mean, the standards that we want to see, of course, should provide value to us. Um, and of course, yeah, there are a number of standards that are currently on the radar of the commission. 
and I would invite the, 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 the people listening to this uh, to consult the, the report of AI Watch, where they identified eight different standards that have a high value of being operationalized um, in support of the act. They're, they're obvious candidates uh, for, for uh, becoming harmonized under the act. They're not without yeah, um, yeah. questions being raised, however, because if you look at some of these standards, some talk to, for example, uh, assessment of machine learning classification performance. That's something that we can use in our sector because we have a gap there, but others are about uh, life cycle management of AI systems. I mean, we already have IEC 6234 on software system life cycle management for medical device software. There's also standards on the risk management. We have our own risk management standard in our sector. Same for quality management system standards. It would be unfortunate if we already comply with ISO 9001 or 13485 that we would have to comply with yet another one. Uh, I would rather see that they update our existing standards instead. Yeah, great, Colin. Thank you. And I mean, so I mean, standards do have the, the potential is there um, to provide these sort of practical solutions if they're uh, developed correctly. I I suppose. I mean, I'm conscious of the time now, um, and it's it's been fascinating getting your your perspectives on on all of these topics. But maybe just as a, to to start wrapping it up, I guess um, we're we're already living through a particularly transformative time. Uh, when it comes to regulating uh, digital health uh, and AI in the EU. I mean, what are some things you'd like to see happen in the not so distant future that are going to benefit industry uh, in, in this space? <laughs> and then to the war in Ukraine, <laughs> for starters, yeah. peace and love and environmental sustainability. Uh, and then specifically on AI, I would say, yeah, I would not make. I would not advise people to make uh, policymakers to make uh, legislation that targets artificial intelligence because the term is a, is, a, is an oxymoron. Huh? It's it's elusive, hard to define, and, and subject to change. And what we call intelligent today may no longer be considered intelligent tomorrow. So we, I, I'd rather see that they make legislation that focuses on software, but then software that has or that poses certain risks or or certain risky characteristics like. Its ability to learn and adapt performance during use uh, by means of an opaque model. Another thing that I uh, would encourage is that they establish a truly horizontal and integrated software legislation, one that includes pharma, what, one that ensures that all the alignment issues are resolved and that legal certainty is provided in, 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 the, in the text itself, uh, making it easier to align with the sectorial legislation to consolidate and, and to navigate that space uh, for, for especially smaller companies. And then also, if I look at just our sector, I would encourage uh, international regulatory convergence uh, between the pharma sector and the medical device uh, domain, because I see both the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, the IMDRF, and the International Coalition of Medicines uh, Regulatory uh, Authorities, ICMRA, both are working on guidances for AI-based systems, uh, and I don't see any official liaison between the two silos. So I would encourage these to, to, to come together and, and, and work together at guidances, especially if you consider yeah, the merging of our different sectors, considering, for example, bedside, uh, bedside uh, manufacturing. And other than that, the last thing I would recommend is we, we see that some legislators are, are having advi regulatory advisory services for companies. The UK is planning that, uh, the US has it with their QSEPs. We, we lack such, such a system in the EU. And, and so I would definitely encourage that such systems are put in place because it gives more legal certainty um, before we invest on, on expensive testing. And then, of course, the regulatory sandboxes that the AI Act alludes to will accommodate for that a bit. Also, the testing and experimentation facilities under the Horizon Europe program, they're a good step forward, but regulatory advisory services are definitely something I would uh, encourage uh, to make happen. Great. Okay, uh, Con, thanks for that. I mean, that 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 wraps up the kind of the, 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 the main discussion points. Um, I'm conscious of time. There are questions. I, we're going to try and do one or two at least before we uh, tune out. I mean, I'm just scanning them while you were finishing your last point, Cohen. There are, I saw one quite technical one, one practical one. Um, yeah, we'll start with the kind of, that the high level one. With the EU already struggling to approve notified bodies for MDR submissions, how do you think the EU will handle having enough notified bodies 
approved in time for submissions against the AI Act? I don't think they will. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, in the Parliament public hearings, uh, the, the head of unit of the Commission announced that uh, new product codes will be needed based on AI technologies. Um, they will come on top of the product codes that we already need, that notified bodies already need under the MDR. And there, yeah, this capacity is using everybody's fishing for the same people with the same skills. Um, and so yeah, I don't think uh, they, they've foreseen actually one year of, of time to implement these codes, to implement, uh, to make sure that the provisions are in place. But I, I don't see uh, that notified bodies will, will be having these resources in time or be re will be ready in time um, to combine both the AI requirements and the MDR requirements uh, without impacting our healthcare system. So I, I have my doubts really there. Mm, okay. And so the final question I think we have yeah, time for would be um, about a development and testing. Is there a way to train your algorithm using an MLAI on human subjects in the development stage without treating the study as a clinical investigation? Or would the data be considered automatically a clinical investigation? Yeah, there is a way. But uh, that way assumes that imagine that you have a medical device that is being used within its uh, intended purpose, it has been cleared, or a health and wellness product it has been, is, is, is on the, it's on the market. You could uh, use that within its intended purpose for which it was CE marked. And then in the back end, uh, at, back at the factory or back in the back end of the hospital, uh, learn from what is happening there, of course, with patient consent, because you're, you're using their data. Uh, and then use that information to, to maybe uh, tweak your claims and, and create evidence to, to support an, an extra claim. So that's, that's a possibility. Another one, if it's not already on the market, could be that you, for example, for imaging applications, uh, perform retrospective studies. Um, if the data sets already exist, the patient may have already left the hospital, it's possible to collect that data, uh, of course, again, with consent. Uh, and then use that to build your, your clinical evidence. So you're not testing on the, on the, on the human then, you're of course only testing on the data, so it's, it's possible. Okay, great. Um, okay, that is, that is now all we have time for, unfortunately. Plenty more questions and lots of food for thought when it comes to all things AI and healthcare. Uh, Con, I just want to finish by, by thanking you uh, for sharing all of your, your knowledge and insights with us on, on this session. It, it really has been fascinating uh, to listen to, to what you have to say. And, and also thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in to join us. So if, if you have any of the issues that uh, relate to what we've been discussing today or, or healthcare and life sciences law more generally, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I think there's a, a message just come up about a survey. We'd be very grateful for the feedback if you could fill that in. And uh, we do look forward to welcoming you to uh, our future events uh, in any case. Look forward to